Good afternoon. This is the host, Michelle Padilla, and I am the Aborna Show, and we are back. We had to take a little hiatus. Um, we had moved up uh, from Los Angeles to Sacramento, so we had to get our bearings straight. But I have a special guest today, Stephen Jack Corn. Did I pronounce it right? Jarko. Jarko. Okay. So he, we're going to be talking about the Rolling Twenties and what he does as an actor. So, Stephen, tell me what your book is about and why you came about this book or why you wanted to write this book. Well, um, my uh, dear friend, Paul Pilzer, started this book a couple of years ago in order to explain to his four children what's going to happen over the next 10 years. And uh, Paul uh, is an economist, has written 13 best-selling books, and but unfortunately, he's suffering from a serious disease, and he and his wife called me, and if I would complete the book, and, which I did, and Paul and I have been uh, friends for over 40 years. We've done business in Russia, China, and in this country. Uh, we're the closest of friends, and so it was a labor of love to uh, uh, complete this book for him. Uh, my background uh, is that I'm a lawyer uh, and a CPA, and uh, I've been involved in business and real estate for many years, but for the last 25 years, I've produced and or distributed about 250 motion pictures, and I have a number of businesses in the media space right now, and that's what I do. Uh, on a daily basis, but I've been very interested in the subjects that Paul uh, started on, and I decided that I uh, would complete his work for him. That's kind of cool. Can you tell tell us what the work is about and and how um, how long the process was? Well, uh, Paul had been working on it for a couple of years. Uh, I uh, completed my work in about uh, four or five months. And, uh, you know, he had made a substantial start, but I needed to go through and update it and uh, research a variety of different topics. And, you know, the book deals with particularly uh, the technological innovations that we're seeing, particularly artificial intelligence, which is going to change all of our lives over the next you know, decade uh, in ways at this point we can't even imagine, although we can conjecture based on what we've seen so far. And some of it will be very good and will help improve our lives. Uh, and some of it will be potentially very dangerous. So it's kind of like, I would say, the Terminator. Some people are bringing it up like some, you know, uh, then it's going to be like the Terminator and how we're going to have chips someday and how AI is going to be changing the future as we know it. And like you said, it's already starting uh, some good, some bad. But uh, how does the actors and uh, actresses feel about the, the AI? How do, how do you feel about it? Well, I'm not an actor. I'm a producer. And I own a studio and a streaming service and a variety of media companies. So I'm on that side of the equation. But, uh, you know, the actors and actresses are as evidenced by the writer's strike and the screen actors strike are very concerned about this. And the studios are also concerned, um, you know, most businesses, particularly technology businesses and media businesses, are going to have artificial intelligence as a seminal part of their business going forward. It cannot be avoided. And it's going to impact you know, the motion picture business and the television business. Um, at this point, um, you know, I've negotiated a lot of deals with actors and with writers. And the typical agreement right now does not anticipate AI be involved. However, the typical agreement provides the studio with very broad authority to use an image of the actor. Uh, 
what the guild is focused on is making sure that that image is used only for the project that is contracted for and is not available to be used for other projects or for other uses that the actor is not being paid for necessarily or the actor uh, is, uh, you know, may have some objections to being involved in a project that he or she did not sh sign up for. So this is uh, not the most important issue for the strike. Probably the most important issue is the nature of residuals and payments on streaming. Uh, and that's a whole other very important topic. Uh, but AI is part of this and uh, will be something that will be negotiated and it will be incumbent on the guilds to be very careful and very sophisticated because this is an area that's going to affect uh, their constituencies uh, indefinitely, probably the rest of our lives. I, I kind of see that and I think it reminds me how, you know, we were watching the Jetsons back then, how we had the flying cars, how we have the, you know, technology we do now. There's, they're doing it right now. And I think, like you said, maybe in time, AI could get approved a little bit better and work its way to where uh, technology is. But uh, right now it's just, and a lot of people are afraid of AI and they don't know what AI is. Is that correct? Well, it's coming. Uh, it isn't like we can put the genie back in the bottle. Uh, you know, the, and what artificial intelligence has really been with us since the 40s and 50s. Uh, you know, our cell phones, our automobiles, uh, our uh, search engines, recommendations are all based on our form of artificial intelligence. And we can see the corrosive effect that that has had on our culture and our national narrative. So these things are potentially, you know, very dangerous. Um, now we have what is called generative AI, which is based on what are called large language models where uh, artificial intelligence uh, is able to access and sift and winnow through literally hundreds of billions of data points and is able to assimilate those data points in order to behave in a manner that is similar to a human or in many cases faster and smarter than a human being. Now, some of the work that's being done by AI is rather crude right now. If you've ever experimented with chat GPT or any of the other chat bots, you get some good answers and you get some answers that don't make any sense. But this is a field that is accelerating in its intensity. Uh, every single major technology company, the wealthiest companies in the world, see AI as a part of their future. And they are devoting you know, billions of dollars to the development of AI. And as a result, it's going to replace a lot of human functions. Uh, it's going to change the nature of work for a lot of people. Uh, it's probably gonna cause a great deal of economic and political unrest because of the changes that are going to occur. Uh, it's going to make people very anxious. And in the case of actors and actresses, um, it probably will not replace them, but it certainly is going to alter the kind of work they do. And it's going to require, again, the guilds to negotiate very carefully to protect their constituency. With respect to writers, I ha you know, I'm a writer myself. I've written you know, a, a number of books and a number of screenplays over the years. Um, I do not see it really replacing uh, writers. I've seen no evidence yet that it can do so. However, it's a very useful tool in terms of cleaning up language, assisting with the formulation of ideas, assisting with the, the three-act structure of a screenplay. 
I think it could be more of a tool for writers than something that they should be fearful of at this point. I think you're, I agree with you. And so my, my, my question is, how would this affect with people with disabilities? You think it would be an advantage for them or the opposite? I think it's going to be an advantage. I think it's going to be something that's going to make their lives easier. Um, there are companies specifically focused on that as their objective and using AI in that regard. Um, it's going to permit doctors to literally billions of data points and particularly in the case of rare conditions and disabilities and rare illnesses, it's going to make a huge difference in terms of a doctor assimilating this data, understanding what it means and reaching, you know, some plausible notions of how to deal with a particular disease. It's also going to affect surgeries. Um, we already have nanobots, which are very, very small robots, which comprise a lot of the surgical applications, but it's going to get, uh, you know, literally a multiple times better. And it's going to improve the quality of surgery but where I'm really excited about is the quality of diagnosis, whether it be you know, a psychiatrist trying to diagnose a mental condition or a doctor trying to assess various options for dealing with cancer. Um, it, it's it's going to be hugely better over the next 10 years. And there are companies focused specifically on this. Well, I don't know if you noticed, but um, I myself, I got diagnosed. This is how the awareness show came about. And so I'm learning all the uh, cool technology like AI. Um, I got diagnosed with 22Q11. So what it is, is a, a missing piece of a chromosome. And it's second to most common to Down syndrome. And so we didn't have AI when I got tested for it. And we got tested, it's called FISH, F-I-S-H. It's a genetic testing that helps people with finding things wrong with them, like a disability or any kind of uh, condition. So um, I have basically um, a heart condition. I had um, sinus problems, mouth problems, and there are over 200 symptoms, but each person is different. So I'm wondering, would this help the future uh, patients who have 22Q understand what AI is, if that makes sense? Well, potentially, uh, it's going to be huge for yourself. Um, and um, what is the prognosis for your condition? Uh, what's going to happen you know, over the next few years? Well, they said it could get worse. Um, that The life expectancy plan for me was 21 years old. I am now 47. And like I Pretty said... Good. Yes, <laughs> um, a lot of people in my uh, who have 22Q suffer schizophrenia at the age of 17. Mm. I, I don't have that, thank God. Um, also, they have dementia. Uh, some have anger management issues. Um, as we get older, sure. they're going to be finding more and more uh, issues with this. So, like I said, it, it, everybody's different. Um I've had three open heart surgeries. I've had two sinus surgeries. I've had two mouth surgeries. And so um, when you have that much and you go, you've been diagnosed, you're not diagnosed as a kid when you're growing up. Uh, I was diagnosed at the age of 30. So that's how I found out that I had 22Q. Um, I knew about the heart condition. I knew about, you know, my other issues, but we didn't know it was tied into 22Q. And that's how we took the genetic testing. So I'm hoping this would help, uh, help, help with a lot of patients who are like me and who have other rare diseases. Well, first of all, you're extraordinarily heroic in the life you're living and how active you are and how engaged with the world. And, and I think that's one of the ways that we can help our mental acuity and our ability to have a positive attitude. 
um, is by staying engaged with the world. And so long as you do these kinds of conversations and establish these kinds of personal relationships, that's going to help quite a bit, I would think. But uh, as I said, I do think that this is going to have a very positive impact on people experiencing uh, your condition, as well as multiple other unusual and rare diseases. This, you know, AI, unfortunately, has a more than zero chance of being the end of us. There is, <laughs> there is that possibility. It's not a probability, but it's a possibility. And it's a more than zero chance. However, in the meantime, it's going to assist us with people who have uh, disabilities, conditions, uh, particularly unusual ones and rare ones that you don't see every day. Yep. Because, because it's able to access all of the data that's out there, um, which in the past, you know, it, it's very, and you've seen this, I'm sure, it's very difficult dealing with doctors, first of all, articulating what your condition is, <laughs> yes. getting, getting, getting doctors to coordinate amongst themselves, particularly when you have multiple doctors. And, you know, our medical system and our medical system reimbursements is very dysfunctional. Yes. <laughs> and incredibly difficult to deal with, to figure out who is going to pay for something, where I should go, is one doctor talking to the other doctor? Um, I just uh, experienced my, the death of my uh, girlfriend of many, many years from cancer. Uh, she was diagnosed about a year and a half ago and I took her to more than 70 treatments and appointments. And yeah, yeah I'm sure you know what this is like, what this drill is like being at hospitals and yep. being with doctors. And it's, it's exhausting, uh, particularly for someone who's fighting a disease or a disability. So um, I'm really confident that artificial intelligence, simply because it's able to simulate data and understand that data faster and more coherently than human minds, is going to be a huge benefit. However, uh, in the wrong hands, or if it is, you know, consolidated uh, among tech billionaires who have other agendas, it can also be very dangerous. dangerous. Yep. You know, one agree. area where it's one one area where it's going to be dangerous is with respect to autonomous weapons systems, where uh, the targeting and the kill decision ends up being made by a machine rather than by a human. And the Department of Defense has said, well, you know, we're gonna make sure that all decisions are made by humans. The problem is the Chinese, the Russians and others are not gonna be uh, hamstrung with these kinds of moral decisions and we need to be able to deal with them. And so at some point, I suspect we are going to have autonomous weapons systems. And at that point, it'll be out of our hands with respect to you know, military attack systems. And this, this is potentially something that can wipe out, you know, many humans. Yep. There's also the potential for bac bacterial warfare. Um, you know, there was a, a recent experience that uh, a, a, a group of friends of mine who were at one of the major universities uh, were working on putting together new molecules with the uh, objective of dealing with certain diseases. Well, uh, just to experiment, they decided to see what AI would do in terms of combining molecules that would be toxic uh, or very negative to the human system. And they came up with 43,000 different molecules simulated by AI overnight. Wow. So there's a huge danger, huge risk with respect to all of this. And we need to sub that. Um, I'm somewhat encouraged because um, litigation associated with this, associated with actors and writers, but also with respect to 
harm that these systems cause. Uh, so our courts are going to be very busy uh, yeah. with these <laughs> kinds of uh, decisions. In addition, you know, I have to say our, our Congress, our legislative bodies are incredibly active right now and are really attempting to get a handle on this, something they really did not do with social media. They kind of dropped the ball because in 1996, Section uh, 230 of the uh, Social Media Act held that social media companies, platforms, were not responsible for their content. Wow. Even though newspapers and magazines who are publishers are responsible, these platforms are not. And as a result, we've seen what this does. Yeah. To, uh, you know, it's, it, it really has caused a great deal of conflict uh, and um, anxiety and anger among our populations. And um, that, could have, that could have been prevented. But I'm hopeful that Congress will be much more active. Uh, the other day, all 50 uh, attorney generals of, of the states uh, submitted a uh, provision that would limit the use of AI with respect to creating images of child pornography. Wow. Um, and this is just one area, Yeah. but it, it's one of those important areas. And I'm hopeful that people will understand more about this, try to you know, read and research and think about what AI might mean geopolitically as well as to their own lives and that our legislative, our executive and our judicial will be very active in dealing with all these issues. And, you know, based on what I've seen, I'm cautiously optimistic. Well, I think that's a good idea. And like you said, uh, AI will help a long, a long way with patients and uh, other researches. Uh, and so I am looking forward, forward to learning more about AI and the challenges and disadvantages of AI and see how it grows in the next few years. Um, I think, what about music in the music industry? How will it help in the music industry? Well, we've already seen AI creating uh, digital singers and performances and songs. And um, a couple of them have had some success. So uh, this is an area that, again, is going to need to be looked at very carefully. Um, and in fact, um, one of the digital songs, which combines the work of two human uh, singers uh, into an AI generated performance uh, is going to be nominated for a Grammy. Wow. So uh, this, this is going to affect, now, you know, what has happened with music um, is that uh, the music companies by going to a streaming model have reduced the value of music, uh, reduced the value of content. You know, if you can get music by signing up for a streaming service rather than buying a record or an album, now music isn't worth as no. much as it was. And the same thing <laughs> has happened with film and television. And this is a uh, consumer surplus, which is what the economically the concept is it's created consumer surplus but on the other hand it's damaged the revenue model for the music companies the music labels and for the individual artists <clears throat> now artists that are you know one in a million like taylor swift have no problem because of their live performances and because of their incredible success incredibly difficult for the average musician to make a living and in the past, they've been able to, and now they really can't. Uh, this may also become the case for actors and actresses. Now, 
I have a question. What about sports? How do you see AI taking over sports? Like baseball, football? Well, sports has been... Uh-oh. I don't see it uh, affecting, um, but what uh, will happen is, you know, sports have becoming becoming more and more analytical. Uh, you know, you can anticipate um, how, uh, how fast a runner will run, uh, what his percentage possibilities are of catching a ball. Um, and we'll see that become more and more detailed and more and more analyzed using, using artificial intelligence but at this point, I don't see it affecting the nature of the game. Okay. Okay. Well, and, looks like, the, yeah. And, you know, sports has continued to be a huge business. That is true. Um, so my question is, we're almost out of time. Where can they, um, where can my audience find the book? And how can they uh, look up you if they want to get more information about the book? Well, um, the book is called The New Roaring Twenties. It's available on online through Amazon and Walmart and all of the online merchants. It's also uh, in Barnes and Noble and your local independent bookstores. Uh, I encourage people to go to their independent bookstores and either buy the book or order the book. Um, and, um, you know, if they want to learn more about the book and myself, they can simply Google me and you'll, you'll, you'll find more than you really want to find out about my career and the book. Yeah, um, I was telling my mom about you and she goes, I watched one of those movies she directed. That's so cool. So uh, it's just me and my mom. Uh, my dad has been a big part of the awareness show. He just recently passed. Um, so oh, uh, yeah, he had a heart attack in March. So he was the one that encouraged me to do the awareness show. And so um, I'm continuing it with now. And like I said, um, He's uh, been there for me as a supporter. Um, I looked at your bio. You have a wonderful career at bio and all these different movies, you know. And my mom loves disaster movies. So she she has a day where she just watched Twister, Sharknado, Ice Castle, all these different movies. And nobody else watches it but her. That's how she relaxes. <laughs> so my mom loves disaster movies. And when I told her about you, she's like, oh, my God, that is so cool. So, you know, and then she tells her sisters and then they ask me how I get my guest on the show. And I said, well, I have a special a connection with uh, Harlan who helps me get on the show. And so technology isn't my friend, but I'm still learning different kinds of technology. And we've been doing podcasting for 11 years now um, before it got huge. And so we, we broke away from KDHR. And so what I now now do is edit my Zoom and I put it on YouTube and then I put my audio on iTunes. So that's what I'm learning. And hopefully with AI, I can learn a little bit more and see how that works because I know they're now on Google Docs. I didn't know that. And I know they're on Microsoft. So there's, you know, something to work, look forward to and see how I like it and, and see if it's user friendly for me. So, <laughs> well, I wish you the best of luck. You deserve it. Well, thank you. And I would, uh, I would like you to come back on the show and talk more about AI because this is a fascinating subject. And I think a lot of people should be more aware of AI and how it's going to look in the future. It certainly is. So, well, thank you very much for this conversation. I really enjoyed it. Well, thank you, Stephen, and I hope you have a good day and the rest of your day, weekend. Have a good night. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.